Midway, um, senior economist in the new what? New Economics Foundation. <laughs> yes, <Never>. James. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, thank you. Uh, right, this is the starting point, I suppose, is the deal uh, struck um, last week that, that was supposed to rescue uh, Europe uh, and therefore also the world economy. Um, it will do nothing of the sort, and, and I'll come on to that in a start. Uh, and then also, obviously, what looks like the, the failure of the, the G20 summit to come up with anything at all. I mean, just this very, very vague statement saying, you know, it'd be nice if the crisis was ended, perhaps something will turn up. I'm, I'm paraphrasing the, the kind of the content of it slightly. Uh, so so that, those are the two sort of institutional political bits, the international political bits that have happened over the last week. Uh, one, which I'll return to, just, you know, it's no solution at all, and it's liable to make things worse. That's the EU deal. The second one is a complete failure of the G20 to come up with any kind of uh, real, real solution to the economic crisis in Europe in the first instance, and then most likely across the rest of the world in the second instance. What I wanted to talk about really was a way of trying to think about this, particularly inside Europe, which is a kind of collision between the national and international dimensions of the crisis. And that kind of gets us to the heart of why it's so serious inside of Europe in particular, because what you're talking about at the moment is uh, a crisis not just so much of the economy, but of the institutions that are supposed to run and regulate the economy, in the particular case, the Euro, and then the, the wider structures of the European Union. And, and the starting point there, I suppose, is, is a, a remark, because this gets us into, you know, what is the EU, and why is it there, and what are the separate nations of Europe all doing in this thing in the first place, which gets us into a, a kind of throwaway remark Trotsky made in the, in the 19... 20s, 1920s, early 1930s, that Europe resembles nothing so much as a system of cages in the impoverished provincial zoo, with all the kind of animals inside these little cages, sort of hungrily looking at each other and wondering if they have the opportunity to kind of get out of their cage and go and like gobble one of one of the you know the slightly more starving lions or whatever uh, down the road, which of course is more or less what happened in, in the Europe in the 1930s. The the point here being that the system of cages, the European nation state system, essentially developed over the few hundred years previously that had been fixed more or less in place since the 1860s or so became unable to contain the economies of Europe. The economies of Europe grew beyond the system of cages that, that they'd all been placed into. Uh, and so they, they started devouring each other. So most obviously, for example, Germany uh, in, in, the in, in the Second World War. That you have this economy that grows outside the state system and goes off and gobbles uh, a bunch of its neighbours. That's, that, that is what the metaphor is trying to get at. And I, and I think it still essentially applies because it's also describes why the EU was set up in the first place, why there is a move dating really from right at the very end of the Second World War, uh, attempts to overcome that system of cages and create a, a, an international framework for everyone to, to sit inside. That these, what were by the end of, of World War II, very, very um, dilapidated, increasingly uh, disliked institutions, which is the European state system, had to be kind of rescued, as, as one of the historians of the EU puts it, Alan Millward puts it, that they had to be rescued by the creation of these supranational entities, uh, in particular between France and Germany, which are two countries that essentially been at loggerheads in one form or another for, for the last 150 years or so, culminating disastrously in obviously the, the, you know, the genocide of the Second World War. So that's something driving the, the creation of the EU institutions in the first place. That is why those things are set up. It's an attempt to overcome the restrictions placed on capitalism inside the, the European state system. And that's for 30 odd years or so. It kind of works. I mean, it sort of, it sort of um, fits into a massive expansion of capitalism from the end of the Second World War, really right the way through to the 1970s, sometimes described, described in France as the 30 glorious years elsewhere. I think Eric, Eric Hobsbawm calls it a golden age for capitalism. And if you look at it, it's, you know, it's when the welfare states appear, uh, it's when there's a massive expansion of access to education, uh, universal free education, at least up until 15 or 16 or so for most people, and then also an expansion of higher education uh, beyond that point, very, very substantially so. Uh, full employment right the way across Western Europe, uh, absolutely everywhere. I mean, you could just walk into whatever job you wanted on leaving school, and if you didn't like the job you had, you'd pretty much walk out and get another one uh, the following day. Very strong, stable trade unions that are able to push increasingly for uh, high wages, the spread of mass consumption. Essentially, capitalism, as, as, as a Tory Prime Minister put it at the time, never had it so good. There, there hasn't been a point in its history previously where it was able to deliver all these sort of things for a great chunk of its population. And the, the institutions of, the, of Europe and the EU, what became the EU, are, are a kind of part of that. They're a part of um, constructing and making the golden age function. And then that all suddenly runs into a brick wall. 
uh, essentially in the 1970s, for, for reasons we don't go, want, need to go into particularly here. But that system falls apart. This growth disappears. The crisis in the 1970s uh, is severe, and it brings an end to this process of growth that the EU institutions, what became the EU institutions, has adapted themselves to and helped foster in a, in a certain sense. Now, the most graphic example of where this process broke down, uh, to take the national level again, is Italy, which had, uh, had enjoyed what is often described as an economic miracle coming out of the Second World War. I mean, really phenomenal rates of growth up there with China today, for example, 10, 7 to 10 percent a year. This country that had otherwise been only really recently created uh, suddenly enjoying a massive expansion in its economy, going from a backward, mostly agricultural country to being what it is now, which is one of the largest e economies in the world, in a relatively short space of time. Italy expands for years and years, decades really, and suddenly hits a brick wall and then basically stagnates for, forevermore. And that, I think, is roughly the, the situation it, it finds itself in now, that this economy that did grow, suddenly the growth disappears, the dynamic that seems to be there disappears, and it runs into a brick wall. Brick Wall, the 1970s, produces a response that, that we've already kind of mentioned earlier. Terry Eagleton touched on it, and, uh, and I think a few people uh, raising questions also mentioned it, which became known as neoliberalism, which we're familiar with in, in this country because it's what Margaret Thatcher did, and obviously it's what Pinochet did in Chile and across much of Latin America. It becomes the way that capitalism tries to get out of the crisis of the 1970s. It becomes the thing that, uh, it becomes a set of rules about how you run capitalism. It's the, it's the instrument instructions, if you like, for any government thinking, what do we do to get out of this, this lack of dy dynamic, this lack of accumulation, this sudden collapsing growth, the rise in unemployment, what do we do? The answer comes back, basically liberate capital. Uh, get rid of the rules that surround, in particular, how finance capital operates. Tear up treaties that uh, provide protection at work. The, these are the kind of instructions. Privatise. Privatise wherever possible. Take things that the government's running and hand them over to the private sector. The theory here is that by kind of loosening up the constraints on capitalism, it will make it work better. That once it's kind of set free of the sort of restrictions that were put in place during the golden age, during this, this boom of capitalism, it will grow fast, it will become a more productive, dynamic system and therefore everybody will be better off. It is an attempt to deal with the crisis of the 1970s by liberalising capitalism, by loosening it up and by trying to allow capital more freedom to manoeuvre against the claims of labour, against the claims of workers, reducing costs, pushing down wages, allowing bosses to run companies much more freely than they would otherwise be able to do so, privatisation, liberalisation, allowing financial markets to expand very, very dramatically. Now that starts to take an institution institutional form inside Europe because these sets of institutions, the things that became the EU, what was the European Economic Community, what was a series of rules about how companies, uh, countries would trade with each other in particular, start to adopt this neoliberal approach and it becomes what the EU does as well because there's an identification that Europe did grow, the countries of Western Europe in particular did grow, did do very well. That period comes to a halt in the 70s, going into the 80s, and then it produces a response. And the response across Europe is to turn the institutions of Europe into institutions that try and force neoliberalism everywhere. And in particular, the creation of the euro and uh, the writing, the drafting of the Maastricht Treaty, which paves the way for that, uh, deliberately enshrines a kind of neoliberalism. It says that if you want to be in the euro, you have to also run your economy on neoliberal lines. In particular, it says that you know, there are going to be restrictions on how much you can borrow and spend inside your economy, and at the same time, thanks, and at the same time, uh, we're going to liberalise finance right the way across Europe. Now, that's a setup. What happens over the 10 years of the euro's uh, creation uh, and its, its, its presence in the world, its use as a single currency, is that it becomes obvious, and certainly by now, by now it's, it's really very obvious that this setup just doesn't work. It produces inside the European economy not what is hoped for, a massive expansion of production, dynamism in capitalism, all this sort of thing. What it produces instead is a dynamism in the financial sector, which becomes very, very good at producing debt and shuffling debt around and giving debt to people, but no real recovery in real economic activity, no recovery of the dynamic that was there in the, in the 50s, 60s, into the 70s. That doesn't happen. What we get instead is a kind of debt-fueled growth, and it takes a particular form inside Europe of 
due to the way the euro is set up, due to the differential uh, exchange rates, the rates of exchange that countries have as they enter the eurozone in 1999, leads to very, very severe imbalances inside the euro. Germany able to export into southern Europe, southern Europe buying huge quantities of goods in particular from Germany. The financial system recycling the surplus that Germany makes back down as debt to southern Europe so they can carry on buying German products. This colossal system of imbalances that opens up. Great big surpluses in northern Europe, great big deficits in southern Europe then runs into the global financial crisis of 2008, at which point it becomes the crisis of the, of the European system. Now, just to be clear about this, there's a lot of talk about Greece is the problem in Europe. It's always Greece's fault. It's like, if only we hadn't allowed Greece into the euro in the first place, none of this would have happened. And you get a whole load of what, it's very tempting to call Greek myths about the state of the economy there. That, you know, Greeks are just lazy and profligate, and they've all borrowed far too much, and it's their fault the entire system's gone into crisis. I want to argue quite the opposite uh, case applies, that this is a, a crisis of the European institutions that has become most severe inside of Greece. And, and just to be clear about this, Greeks, Greeks work essentially on average around about the longest hours in Europe. Um, they retire on average uh, at a later year than do Germans, are always held up as being terribly hard working and all the rest of it. The Greek government spends less as a percentage of its economy, as a percentage of GDP uh, on public services than the European average and certainly a lot less than France or Germany. So in other words, Greeks aren't lazy, they aren't profligate, they haven't spent too much money. Everything you hear about this is complete nonsense on that side and what you're looking at is a crisis of the European institutions for forcing itself from Greece and taking its most extreme form in Greece. So the way that has emerged to deal with the crisis of the European institutions, in particular the Eurozone, is not to say, well, it was always kind of a mistake to do neoliberalism. What it really did was create loads of debt. It held down wages. It didn't allow demand to expand. It didn't create uh, new productivity in the economy. It was always a mistake to do that. Let's kind of do something different. What they actually get is a, an increasingly extreme version of neoliberalism under the guise of austerity measures. So you say to Greece, and the EU and the IMF and the European Central Bank have all been saying to Greece for the last 18 months, OK, look, your economy's screwed. Uh, there's no real prospect of it recovering anytime soon, so, but you still have to make the debt repayments, so we're going to insist that you chop away at what public services you have and make the debt repayments happen. And that's been how, how Greece has, has been run. Essentially, I wouldn't say quite run by the IMF, although you know, part of the deal last week was precisely trying to drag it in that direction, how it's been run for the last 18 months or so. Uh, the austerity is the response of Europe to the crisis because essentially it can't, can't really see any other way out of it. Now, what you had in the deal last week was an attempt to both maintain austerity as the general response to the crisis inside the Eurozone, the, the only kind of route out of the mess that we're in at the moment, whilst maintaining the Euro, and that's a kind of a prize for, for European leaders, particularly France and Germany. It, it gives them a kind of clout in the world stage to have the thing. So they want to maintain the Euro. The only real response that they've got for everybody else inside Europe is austerity. So as far as possible, pushing the costs of the crisis away from the banks, away from the rich, and onto everybody else, onto the rest of society, and saying that we will privilege financial assets, we'll privilege the repayments of debt over actually having schools and hospitals, retiring at a reasonable age, paying pensions, paying our own workers. Uh, we'll privilege financial assets over real economic activity. That's the response of the, the Eurozone in general. And that's precisely what becomes enshrined in the deal done last week, which one part of which is a debt write-off for Greece, very generously, I suppose. They're saying that Greece can just sort of cancel about half its national debt uh, on the condition that the IMF uh, then runs the Greek finance ministry and on the condition that it ties itself into at least a three-year program of very, very severe austerity uh, inside that country. Now, this doesn't work for mechanisms that, that are well known. If you cut spending in a recession, it makes the recession worse. We've known this since the 1930s. Because if government cuts back on its own spending, it means there's less demand in the economy. If there's less demand in the economy, firms lay off workers, cut wages, you get trapped into a vicious cycle of decline. That's precisely what's taking place in Greece. It's precisely what's taking place in Ireland, precisely what's happening in Portugal. This is the mechanism of, of stagnation inside of Europe at this point in time. But it's the only thing the EU leadership will provide. The other part of it is a bank recapitalisation. We say that the banks 
uh, still very, very fragile. They're still exposed to the risk of the debt that these banks actually hold. The sovereign debt in Greece is held by French and German banks. If Greece defaults, then they're at risk of collapse. We need to recapitalize them, which means that we ask the banks to hold more in reserves than they would otherwise have. Uh, Essentially, because the banks can't raise this money themselves, because who's going to give money to, to you know, what looks like a really ropey bank who don't want to do this, <coughs> it will end up becoming another bailout for the banks, to, to the tune of about 109 billion euros for, for the whole of Europe. And the final part of it is this, this so-called European Financial Stability Facility, which is, without getting too far into the details, held up as this big, wonderful fund that, if anything bad happens, it's got a trillion euros that it can use to kind of bail out countries or bail out banking systems and because of this everything's going to be okay is a complete fiction, it's absolute nonsense, it contains no money at all but what it does have is a load of promises from various people to give it money and of course a promise to give money uh, is not quite the same as actually having money and there's no guarantee that if this money, this trillion euros that it's supposed to have is ever actually needed everyone will just go, ah sorry um, we're not actually going to hand over the cash because it's like really expensive so it's nonsense, the whole thing <coughs> is complete nonsense now, to sort of come to a conclusion somewhat over time, but then again, Matthias isn't actually here yet, so probably going to work out all right. And it's, mm -hmm. it starts to, it starts to look like this, I think. That, that's kind of objectively where we are. The solution offered by the EU, backed up by the IMF and the European Central Bank, is essentially austerity. It's essentially saying, we can't really see a proper way out of this, so we're just going to try, as far as possible, put the costs of it onto the rest of European society. That's their solution to it. I think if you're on the left, you have to say, well, actually, the first thing we need to say, the first thing that has to happen is that austerity stops. And the demand to call a halt to the program of cuts, I think, is the starting point for any kind of way out of the crisis, certainly any progressive way out of the crisis. You say, stop the cuts, you say, start spending again, and that is what's going to build for economic recovery. I think that's the first part of it. The second parts of it start to vary if you look across Europe. Um, Matthias, if he was here, would be probably able to talk about what's happening in Greece. In the case of Greece, I think it's becoming clear, and I think it's going to happen anyway, that Greece needs to leave the euro. This is absolutely crippling the Greek economy. It's ludicrous for the the country to still be trapped inside the single currency like this, it has to leave the euro and it has to default on its debt. The debt is unpayable for Greece, it has to just write it out. That I think is a, a plan for Greece. For the rest of the Europe, it, it looks slightly different. It looks different if you try and see what are the immediate steps you, you want out of this. But, but to, to finish, look, this is, um, it's not just a severe crisis because the numbers are bad and you can sort of point at unemployment and say, yes, that's really high. You know, 40% of under 25 year olds unemployed in Spain, 50% uh, or potentially more actually in Greece, 20% uh, even in this country where things aren't quite so severe yet. Yeah, the numbers are bad, but the reason it's such a severe crisis is because it's a crisis of institutions. In particular, it's a crisis of the European institutions. They can't cope with the severity of the economic fix that they've got themselves into, and there has to be an alternative offered here. Now, to get to that alternative, to start to end austerity, to start to say we can rebuild the economy on the basis of workers' interests rather than capital's interests, we can <coughs> rebuild it on the basis of real activity that actually produces stuff rather than financial activity, which enriches a few people but creates crisis for the rest of us, to get to that point, actually, I think, is to open the question of not just um, radical change inside Europe, but really opens the question of, of revolution inside Europe. That there has been, there has been this year, revolutions on the south side of the Mediterranean, there is no real reason why it shouldn't also happen on the north side of the Mediterranean. The, the severity of the crisis we're in and the absence of any real sort of institutional, meaningful institutional response at a European level beyond saying austerity and the failure of national governments to be able to cope with the crisis themselves I think opens the question of not just um, changing things around a bit, reforming things a bit, making capitalism look a bit nicer. It opens a question of how does the European state system operate? How does power operate inside our societies? And if we want to get on top of this and break the mechanism of stagnation, the recession, the rest of it, you really have to start talking about revolution. And I'll finish there. Government has been asked repeatedly to implement austerity measures. The problem is that the Berlusconi government is extremely weak, so it cannot do it because it doesn't have the parliamentary support to implement these measures. This has led to a situation which is what happened yesterday in which the IMF and the, BIS and the European Union basically has asked to have some inspectors in Italy 
to basically look after what the government is doing and make sure that actually these austerity measures are implemented. I think this is actually quite a crucial issue because it leads back to what John was saying earlier about the issue of democracy. I mean, on the one hand, this situation is uh, humiliating for every Italian person, and it's very clear that uh, the IMF has basically the power to declare the state of exception and to take over the sovereign, sovereignty sorry, in Italy and decide what politics has to be done. And so this is outraging. But on the other hand, what is positive in this in, is that for the first time it's clear to everyone and we have really to talk about this and to push forward this issue, that parliamentary democracy in a context in which actually uh, transnational capital has such power is devoid of meaning. And so that if we don't have any sort of democratic control also in the economic sphere, actually it's absolutely pointless to talk about institutions and parliament and this sort of stuff because actually it's not there that the power lies and people actually have no control on what is going on. Okay, thank you. Um, but more, and the ending of collective <coughs> bargaining with trade unions which has already happened in Greece. This has been approved by a European Parliament in which the right wing has a majority and essentially the centre left goes, uh, goes, uh, goes along with it. And we should be paying attention to this because this is what Cameron is going to come here and start saying, uh, saying as well. The second thing I wanted to say, when Nicola Sarkozy said the collapse of the euro might lead to war in Europe, people's uh, eyebrows were raised because people felt, think, and probably he did mean, the idea is going to be another war over Alsace or Well, it's worth just thinking about where would you bet on a war in Europe taking place? Where has a war in Europe <coughs> taken place in the last decade and a half? The Balkans. Greece owns 27% of Bulgaria's banks, 25% of Macedonian banks, 17% of Romanian banks, and 16% of Serbian banks. These banks are going to go to the wall. Macedonia's credit has already dried up, and it's joined a line of begging bowls in Beijing, wanting money. The amount of debt in these economies, encouraged to take out by the same Greek banks, who encourage people to take out mortgages, for instance, they have to repay in euros, right, is astronomical. There is a debt crisis and a banking crisis developing in, in, in the Balkans, which is unbelievable. And just to end on, the Greeks are prepared to lend money to Macedonia and to buy into their banking system. The Greek government won't recognize the name Macedonia. Right? I mean, that is the sort of tension that still exists in the, uh, in the Balkans. An economic crisis leads to war, and maybe Sarkozy wasn't so wrong. Thank you. What question of political and economic contradictions here? Because I think that, um, you see, when you think of the problem, it's not just an economic problem. Every single member state of the European Union has its own domestic agenda. That's why Cameron, there's suddenly this right-wing revolt over Europe, which hasn't happened for years and years. And suddenly Cameron, when he goes to Australia, starts saying, well, of course, the problem is Europe is trying to restrict the city of London and imposing all these regulations on it. In other words, it, you know, he gets whacked by the right wing. His response is to accommodate to them. And this is happening in every country in Europe. But, you know, the right wing parties go on about immigration or go on about the, the Greeks not working hard enough or all this other kind of thing. And this happens absolutely everywhere. And it seems to me that Therefore, you've got this, this huge political um, crisis as well as an economic crisis going on, particularly because it seems to me that the people running Europe, you know, the, the national governments and the people around the, the EU itself, are completely impervious to what is really going on here. I mean, you know, I was listening to the radio this morning when John Humphreys is in Athens saying, you know, said to this guy, do you want to be in the European Union? He said, no. So they just, what? Why can you not be in the European Union? I was debating with Dennis McShane, who's a pro-European MP, the other day on the radio. His argument is, if you don't stay in the Euro and you don't stay in Europe, you're going to have a right-wing coup, like they had in the late 60s in, uh, in Greece. And you know, this is the kind of argument that people, they've got no idea about what pe the anger that people have got over this kind of thing. And I think it's this that really gives us an opportunity, you know, not just in Britain, but everywhere, um, in Europe to really begin to build organisations that can, that can deal with it. It seems to me this is an absolutely crucial question. Just one final point I want to make. James, do you think, I mean, I think it's very interesting the role of the BRICS, uh, you know, the, the, 
the new emerging industries in in the G20, who must be sitting in Cannes thinking, what the hell is going on here, really? There's this argument going on between all these old powers that aren't growing very much and, and, uh, and all that kind of thing. Do you think we will look back at this year as a turning point in terms of the decline of Europe and the, you know, the, the definitive rise of, of China and India and so on? Thank you. Let's get copies. Yes, there's quite a lot there. Um, yeah. All right. The, yes. The response of the EU institutions, which is, uh, I think it was Chris talking about it, about, oh yeah, um, was exactly as I said, look, the, the response in general has been to say, okay, we've done neoliberalism, it didn't work, so let's do even more of it. I mean, that's basically what, what, what develops as the, the only possible way that these people can agree here. Part, part of the issue with that one is, uh, as Lindsay said, it is, a, it is a bunch of competing states, the Europe. It isn't actually some glorious entity called Europe where everyone kind of holds hands and sings and what, what not. This is a bunch of uh, states. Capitalism is organised as competing national states, and these are groups of competing national states who, for a certain period of time, had some interests that coincided. And one of the effects of crisis gave those interests even, even further apart. And the only common grounds they can find is we can't touch our banking system, we can't touch our wealthy, but we can sure as hell uh, smash up our own societies uh, instead. And that is part of the reason that you get this this drive to austerity. I think it's kind of it's kind of a you know it's a lowest common denominator option as far as the European ruling classes are concerned. They just say you know let's just do this because it's easy. We do anything else, it becomes really difficult and awkward. Now within that, I think it's absolutely right to say that there is this desire to overcome what was an inherent problem inside the euro in the you had a single European Central Bank which set monetary policy everywhere and then you allowed countries a certain room for manoeuvre on their own tax and, and spending. So potentially a country could at least sort of carry on funding its welfare systems or whatever. That they deliberately want to get rid of and as Chris said there's a pr programme in place to try and impose monitoring on, on countries to get over this. And this, this issue of monitoring and surveillance and, and democracy just keeps coming up. You know, the Greek finance ministry, all the parties in Greece as far as I can tell, inside parliament um, you know, with the usual exceptions of the far left and the communists and things are basically signed up to saying yes we'll agree to the deal otherwise we face God knows, national bankruptcy or something. Uh, as part of that deal, we will agree to not run our own tax and spending policies anymore, and we will allow, uh, they'll be called observers, but they won't be because they'll be running the things, we'll allow a major plank of what it means to have any kind of parliamentary democracy, which is control over how your government spends your money, just hand it over to someone else. Italy has already signed up to this, apparently to avoid having to go and ask us for a loan elsewhere. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a ludicrous situation. It's becoming increasingly clear that Austerity as such is not compatible with democracy in any sense because after a while people just get fed up with being told that everything, everything is going to get worse for you forevermore because that's basically what austerity means in the end. You know, there is now open talk about we will be stagnating in this country for the next decade. You know, uh, and you can just see and everybody knows it, the effects of the cuts to education spending, the introduction of tuition fees, or rather massive increase in tuition fees for universities. You can see the kind of impact it has and there's not very much chance that people will just sit there and go, okay, yes, uh, fair enough, we, we'll just put up with this. Of course people won't put up with this. And so the issue of democracy, right the way through our society, gets forced open by the crisis. And I think it's particularly uh, telling that one of the big things about the Occupy movement, starting really in Wall Street, moving to London, is precisely the issue of democracy and how you control these things. And that if we're going to talk about seriously transforming the societies we live in, then a fusion of the basic demand that we shouldn't be cutting spending, that you know we don't want schools and hospitals and all the rest of it to be closed, with the fusion of this idea that democracy actually matters and taking back some control over the resources in our society is important. That, I think, is, is the, the place that, that we want to try and get to. Now, the specific question was on why did no one see this coming? Well, I think, you know, I mean, the Queen asked this, but... The, <laughs> <laughs> the Queen asked this at LSE. Uh, look, she, she's been reading the wrong... I mean, she doesn't read right, very much David Harvey, for example. Mm -hmm. She doesn't read very many Marxist economists, economists I'd, I'd assume, on this basis. Clearly a minority of people who might be identified as economists did kind of see this happening. And you know what? Looking back, it's because it's really bloody obvious that this isn't going to work. You can't run uh, anywhere on the basis of continually printing more debt and then trying to stave off the point at which you have to repay the debts. Because that's what's happened in 2008, and that's what we're living through the consequences with now. You can't keep on this kind of trick cycle thing. You know when Wile E. Coyote runs over the edge of a cliff and there's this moment where he's sort of hanging in mid-air, you know, running away, and then as soon as he looks down everything collapses. You, know, you can't run an economy on that basis, yes, because at some point you look down and everything collapses, right? So people did see this happening. Now, 
uh, why did most of the, the economics profession not see this coming? Uh, I'm told this isn't actually uh, very fair to frogs, but there is this expression about boiling frogs. You put a, a frog in a pan of cold water and gradually turn up the heat, and the frog kind of swims around thinking everything's okay until the pan's boiling, and then of course you, you've got a cooked frog, right? So, but apparently frogs aren't that stupid. They'll actually leap out uh, of the boiling water at some point. And I think something, I don't think economists on the whole are as smart as frogs. I think there's an element to which you can see the things building up, but, and maybe some of the frogs will be going, God, it's actually getting quite warm in here. And there's a bunch of kind of economist frogs swimming around saying, no, 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 it's meant to be warm. This is a good sign. This is, this is the economic dynamic. This is a dynamism, the economy that you're, you're now feeling. This is, this is all good. And then everyone's cooked at the end of it. I think there's a degree of this, you know, there's quite a, a sort of, a blindness, a willful blindness, an ideological content to, to economics, which obscures what really ought to be quite obvious features of the economy, quite deliberately so, because it's there in service of a certain group of people at the top of society, and not in service of everyone else, and, and that kind of blinds uh, people to it. So how do we get out of this? Well, uh, yeah. yes, uh, the final bit, because Matteo says his, his bit to, to say as well, is, sorry, um, which is back on the issue of economics and the rest of it. Look, the EU and the rest of it is dull. It's deliberately dull. It's meant to be dull. You're not meant to pay too much attention to what they're doing. It's really boring, really, really insufferably tedious until it turns into the point in which you don't have any identifiable parliamentary democracy anymore and you do have permanent stagnation and everything about your society is being ripped up, apparently on the say-so of a group of people, God knows where, that you have no real say over. So it is incredibly important. As far as what we're doing on the left, I think, goes, is that we, we ought to be quite clear about this and a, and a lack of clarity has crippled the left across Europe is that look there is no reason to pretend that these sets of institutions that make up the European Union which have always been essentially enacted above our heads one way or the other are particularly democratic or favorable for ordinary people they're just not and we have to get beyond the point of saying that we would be queuing up with Sarkozy and Angela Merkel to say, well, hang on, you know, we realise there's a problem, but, you know, we can't touch this idea of Europe and this idea of the Euro. Actually, I think we should be the other side of that argument and say, look, we're internationalists, but the way to get that internationalism is not on the basis of fake kind of EU internationalism, it's on the basis of real internationalism, a recognition of common interests across borders, and that means the interests in the end of the working class and working people are not the interests of the, the squabbling little shower that we have at the top of society. Who is a Greek journalist and activist who will, I'm sure. Okay, I'm, I'm just going to make a few points. I, uh, we were, uh, I stayed up last night because, you know, you all watched maybe that this dramatic conversation in the Greek parliament. They finally didn't come up with a solution, so we were all like until four in the morning trying to figure out what's going to happen, so I, I didn't have time to write anything. Um, but uh, I'd like to tell you a few things about the situation in Greece at the moment. Um, so uh, we've been, the political life in Greece is, is kind of a roller coaster at the moment, and that's because the systemic forces, what we call the systemic forces, like the main parliamentary uh, parties, the Democrats, the Liberals, and the Social Democrats, cannot uh, find a way out of this dead end. And to my opinion, and the opinion of many in the movement, they're not going to find a, a way out. And the reason is very simple. Uh, it seems that capitalism at the moment doesn't need a legitimizing force. So it's, what's happening in Greece, in Greece is characteristic of something that we think that is going to spread in you know, bigger parts of the world, and that is that uh, uh, the economy right now doesn't need forces like the Social Democrats legitimizing what they're doing uh, in, in society. So uh, that's the big problem, and um, that's expressing, of course, strongly in Greece. You know that for the past two years, uh, workers, students, uh, like a, a, a very broad movement of uh, all social forces is on the streets, and it's, it's trying to... Um, to, to overcome this uh, this uh, uh, dead end, and uh, I think that what we, what we experienced for the past two days is a result of the movement, and, and as such, we um, we think it was um, of enormous uh, importance. Uh, the fact that Papandreou, who never intended, uh, George Papandreou is the Prime Minister of, of Greece and the President of the Social Democrats uh, Pasok Party, uh, so. Uh, uh, Possibly you, you, you saw that he, two days ago, after he signed the agreement in, in Brussels last, last Wednesday, he went and said that he would do a referendum. And uh, what is significant about it is that uh, he went there and tried, I mean, he gambled. He, he, you know, he, he threw the dice and uh, he thought that he could might, might persuade the Europeans that he could legitimize what was agreed in Brussels in the Greek public. And then he also thought that he could frame the question for the Greeks uh, and make them agree with what's, what is being discussed in, in, in Brussels. In a very important poll last week, the, the Greeks declared by 70% that they're pro-European, 
and I think it's, you know, it's that it, Greece is the most pro-European country in, in the whole of the Union, but more than 60% is against these agreements and against the memoranda. So the Greeks are stating very you know, simply and very uh, accurately that they want another Europe. And uh, the, the, they, they've got there because of the struggle of, of the left and the movement for, for the past years. The, the, Greeks is, uh, the Greeks more and more want another world. And they think that if struggling, they can get it. And uh, so Papandreou, when he, when he declared the referendum, it was like if he was stating that, listen, that's Europe. That's how Europe is. Take it or leave it. Um, and that was that was the blackmail, uh, and of course it didn't work out. But uh, it, you know, it wouldn't work in Greece. We know that it wouldn't work. I mean, as from next week, new strikes are coming up. The 17th of, no of November is um, the uh, celebration of the, um, uh, the fall of the dictatorship, and every year, massive massive demonstrations are on the streets, and probably um, you know, one of the most massive ones uh, uh, for the past. 20 years maybe we're going to see this year. And then on the 25th of November there's a general strike again. Then in December more strikes are coming up, more occupations. So they they cannot find a way to deal with society. This is not a problem uh, really uh, um, uh, about politicians. This is a split between systemic forces, systemic political forces, you know, the forces of the bourgeoisie and the people. And that and we think that this uh, this split is not permanent. Is not is not going to is not going to get any better. Um, So uh, back to the political field, uh, and I think that that's very important. We, we've watched it happening for, for the past more 10 or 20 years, and it's, it's getting worse and worse, is that social democracy has no meaning anymore in Europe. The social democrats were exactly that force that was uh, able to, uh, to, to bring society to, to the, uh, uh, the main decisions of uh, the uh, systemic forces and the economic forces. They cannot do that anymore. And that's another point that I would like to, to, to highlight as crucial, that when Papandreou got to, to the camps in, in, uh, in the G20 summit and told them that I have a way to, to take the Greeks with me, they told him, we don't care. We don't, we don't care about that. You just stick with the agreements. And so uh, that, that's another thing that we, we need to, to uh, keep in mind. Um, I'm not sure what exactly to say more. Uh, there's a split of confidence now. There's a huge governance pro uh, problem in Greece. Now it's spreading to Italy, and I'm pretty sure that it's going to spread throughout all of the European periphery. And that's the, the, the problem of governance. Yeah, uh, the people in, in government right now, they're trying to uh, restore the confidence of the markets. And while trying to do that, they're creating a problem of confidence with the people. Uh, all sorts of scenarios are possible, but the most possible one is that uh, the periphery will either have to uh, somehow uh, accept to become something like a second class in Europe, like a second class of, of, of countries in Europe, or it will have to split and, and, and Europe will have to remain a northern, uh, like a northern European club alliance or something. Uh, that's extremely dangerous in the long run uh, for the stability in the continent, and that's why the, uh, the Greeks are pro-European. The, re the reason is not that, uh, uh, the reason is that the, the being in the southeast and facing all these nationalisms that uh, really are a huge problem in the area, being in Europe is being in a framework, in a context of, of stability and, and, uh, and peace, really. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, as far as I understand, going out of the euro and uh, breaking up Europe is dangerous in that sense. On the other hand, it's pretty clear now that inside Europe it's extremely difficult to, to form those uh, political dynamics that eventually can lead to that other Europe that the Greeks uh, really desire. Uh, and, and that's because for, for all sorts of reasons. Uh, it, it has been proved that it's very difficult to, to coordinate, for example, uh, working movement, movements of workers between, say, Britain, Ireland, France, Greece, Italy. And, and, and as long as you don't have that, uh, it's, uh, it's, it, it seems a lot easier to, to, uh, to struggle within the national framework. So to my opinion, that's a contradiction we're facing, the movement is facing, and it's going to be worse and worse as, as years go, go by. It will either be stability or it will be uh, democracy. It's absolutely clear now that austerity and democracy cannot function together. It's impossible to function together. And uh, it's also clear now that uh, popular confidence in governance, in, uh, at least in you know, the systemic forces government, is unachievable. So I think that things in Greece will move in a more anti-systemic way, more and more. Uh, 
Of course, you know that probably you know the political map in Greece. In Greece, the left is, is divided. That's another huge problem. We have the Communist Party, which is representing something like 10% of the population, and then we have the coalition and smaller forces, which represent another 10%, and they just can't can work together. That's a huge problem. That's a huge problem. I mean, yeah, we strongly believe that if they could work together, right now we could even uh, claim governance in the country, and whatever that meant. Um, Now, one last word about stereotypes. Greece, uh, Greece is, of course, uh, a scapegoat. Well, I mean, everybody, Europe, Europe is scapegoating uh, on, on, on Greece. So the Greeks <coughs> being lazy, tax evaders, and all of that crap, really. If, if anybody just cared to look at the stats, like the, ba the very basic figures from OECD and these organizations, he would understand that this is, this is crap. But this is indeed is, is the opposite. This is a, an accumulation crisis. And, and the center of it is in Germany and in France and in the north of Europe. And uh, it, what we really have to fight at the moment is uh, forces in Europe which are neoliberal, but at the same time they're conservative. And they will not hesitate to risk uh, stability and peace in the continent by turning to nationalism. Uh, that's my, that's my uh, uh, big problem with uh, what's going on. Uh, I mean, it, it's clear that uh, German economic policy is a nationalistic one, and uh, that the, the French are going along with the Germans. And, uh, that <coughs> at some point we, we need to address that problem, how to overcome not only neoliberal uh, policies in the continent, but also the possible nationalism. I mean, the system has tools to fight uh, the real division, which is really uh, between labor and, and capital, uh, all sorts of tools, and they haven't used all of them. Uh, so uh, I think that you know, solidarity, and uh, not only solidarity, but you know, <coughs> fighting these uh, choices in this country here in the UK, and you know we've been seeing austerity imposed in the UK, and cuts and more cuts are, are coming up, and uh, yeah, because actually this this, this is a, a global economic crisis and it's not going to go, uh, it's it's going to stay here. So we're fighting these uh, these cuts and at the same time developing a universalist spirit as this has been. Um, shaped in the Occupy Wall Street movement and before that in the Indigenous movement and before that in the Arab Spring, there's a wave of revolution. Uh, to my opinion, it's extremely important and it affects it, uh, straight, it affects straight what's going on in Greece and in every other, other country. We have to watch Italy and Italy is now is, uh, the next big uh, uh, break in the, in the continent and um, I just want to highlight an image I saw last week for the first time I saw Italians really uh, rioting on the streets. I mean, the Italians were massively demonstrating, but they were not rioting that much. But you know, one or two weeks ago, there were massive riots on the streets. That's another split within the movement that has to be addressed. Uh, I mean, for example, in Greece, we, we, we know and we have decided that we don't necessarily need to be pacifists. That's the, that's the systemic discourse. No. I mean, violence has been exercised by the state, and it could be exercised by the movement. But <coughs> violence is not the goal. And the goal is to change the system. Mm -hmm. um, and this split between um, anarchist forces and uh, the left forces in Italy is dangerous, in my opinion, and it could just slow down the movement, while the movement now needs to be anti-systemic very fast, now. Mm -hmm. And that's because of this organic crisis, this legitimizing crisis that, uh, that occurs uh, all, all over Europe. And uh, yeah, again, I'd, I'd just like to close saying that uh, I hope, personally hope, and I think that many people hope, and. Uh, in that sense, the UK and London is important, is symbolically important. Whatever happens here, even if it's small, it reflects a lot on what's going on in, in, in the South, because it's, you know, it's the UK. So uh, yeah, anything happening here is important, and I hope that uh, some kind of uh, movement and you know, social struggle will, at some point, be massive here and strong enough in order to, you know, um, <coughs> To, 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 to affect and, and, and uh, enhance and, um, and, and strengthen the struggle that we're doing in the South. Thank you very much. Thank you.